Chapter uh, 15 of the Lalita Vistara is where, uh, where we'll look at today. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have uh, gone to around uh, the section of 139. 139. Uh, so before that, you know, it's still uh, basically he is leaving uh, the humans around him, uh, try to keep him from leaving. The gods <laughs> that are, you know, uh, also there are doing things to uh, make him, you know, go. Basically that. Uh, I'm mostly now at this point, it's his uh, charioteer, the one that uh, is going to lead his horse, uh, Chanda, uh, that is saying, you know, don't go. Finally, so then here, uh, 138. Uh, so Chanda, 137 says, immaculate one, faultless one. Let me go with you wherever you wish to depart for. Yet, please engender love and compassion and take one more look at this palace. So again, you know, Chanda. Chanda is very reasonable, you know. And Chanda is a voice that turns up in our hearts too. In many ways, very reasonable. And we, if we are to remain embroiled in samsara, then I would say having a voice like Chanda is not bad. <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, very reasoned, telling us, uh, telling Siddhartha, with your might and power as the successor to this king, you can do so much good. Have love, have compassion for your people. So Chanda's voice uh, is it's, it's a very reason, a very reasonable voice and very good voice yeah? as long as our decision is to not yet completely transcend samsara. And timing is crucial. So not everyone could do what Siddhartha yeah, is setting out to do. So you can't, you know, like have a kind of a bravery that is not based on having cultivated the true reasons to be brave. And because later on, you'll see when Mara comes and challenge Siddhartha, if he has not indeed cultivated himself through so many lifetimes, so to say, repeatedly again and again, him touching the earth, you know, will not have the earth bearing witness saying, yes, you have done it. So this is not some kind of uh, foolhardiness, not some kind of like bravery based on no substance. We have to recognize that. But Siddhartha at this point knows no, this final step of breaking completely from the clutches of confused existence. This is now the time. So the intelligent one looked at the palace and spoke in the sweetest voice. Until I have made an end to birth and death, I will not return to the city of Kapilavastu. Until I've attained precious awakening, the supreme level of immortality beyond all age and dying, I will not turn my face toward Kapilavastu. Whether I am standing, sitting, lying down, or walking. And so with great resolve, he says, you know, I shall not come back to the city, the city of my birth. And so this notion of leaving the city of our birth it's in a way you could say, you know, it's about growing up. It's about leaving. 
and now more specifically growing up and leaving for the sake of complete awakening for the benefit of self and other. When the Bodhisattva, the Lord of Beings, departed, the celestial maidens traveling through the sky began to sing his praise. So now uh, we get to hear about the qualities of Buddha, or quality of the tenth ground Bodhisattva on the brink of becoming Buddha. So here they sing. He is the marvelous object of offering and the great field of merit, the field for those wishing for merit and the giver of the fruit of immortality. And he is called a field of merit, just as the noble Sangha is often called the field of merit, in the sense like, like, like uh, say, a rice field, you know, uh, you plant rice and it will give you, uh, you can harvest rice from this field. So what you harvest from the Buddha is merit by giving to this field, by making offerings to this field. So the, it's the marvelous object of offering, to offer to the Buddha. This attitude of offering to the Buddha uh, as the most powerful object to offer to in terms of the return of merit, sometimes can get a little too mechanical and greedy so that the spirit of what is being said is lost. And this particularly happens, you know, in places where Buddhism and culture has become so mixed up. So then people think, oh, you know, every time you say, uh, we're going to build another temple or another stupa or another statue, you know, oh, people give money. And then you say, oh, I'm going to build a, 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 a library for kids, you know. Ah, okay, here, 50 cents. <laughs> and so uh, then, of course, we miss the point, you know, here. And so then a skillful way that Kilper Jitinsenbun taught is he says, it is true that um, making offerings to Buddhists uh, in a pure way, and not in a way that, you know, you, you, you are greedy yeah, for returns, uh, but making the offerings to Buddhas with devotion uh, will produce a great amount of merit. But uh, giving to those who, who are really in need is also important and necessary to do. So these two fields of uh, offering or two objects of offering. One is based on uh, the qualities of the uh, objects of offering. And one is based on the need. So we say, we offer the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas out of an admiration of their qualities. And we offer to beings of the six realms, particularly the lower realms, particularly those who are less fortunate than us, out of compassion. So one is out of admiration and one is out of compassion. But if we know how to bring the two together, so out of admiration is the wisdom aspect, out of compassion, the compassion aspect. So the two, two objects, two domains, two groups that we can give to. Now, if we know how to bring these two together, then we can accomplish both at the same time, which is recommended as you give to those who have a need while thinking, imagining, feeling, this is how I truly offer to the Buddhists, to the Bodhisattvas. This is how we truly offer to the Buddhists and bodhisattvas. So in this way, you know, we accomplish both, we accumulate both the wisdom aspect and the compassion aspect. Uh, so here a reminder uh, to you that this is the month of Sakadawa. 
it will, the height of the month is in the middle of the month. But then after the middle of the month, which is this Friday, uh, it's still uh, uh, the month of Usaka. Uh, so, you know, continue to kind of, kind of use it as a time uh, to invigorate uh, our Dharma practice. Then particularly the practice of uh, generosity of giving uh, is the opening of the hearts. So uh, this program that we have been doing I, is completely offered freely, uh, no cost really to me. Uh, Urban Dharma, no real cost, you know, except, you know, the Zoom, all that. Uh, so I want to remind you that you have local sanghas. Mm. Some of them, because of this pandemic, because of this situation, uh, might be more in need than others. So please look around uh, and engage in generosity. Uh, important to support your local sangha, and beyond that, important to support your local community. Yeah. Uh, so don't forget that. Mm. Also, you know, I want to thank some of you who have been very kind and generous. Uh, from time to time, you 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 are thinking of me. Uh, and I thank you for that. But things are well here. Uh, you know, no, no, cannot claim to have needs. So don't worry about me. Uh, but look around. Um, there are certainly needs. Uh, and uh, so if we make offerings like that, you know, recognizing the need uh, and then thinking, understanding that why we're giving those who need it is because out of admiration for the qualities of those who have no needs. Uh, truly no needs are Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. They truly have no needs, you know. Uh, no need is not just, you know, people who are wealthier than us. Actually, they, they can be quite needy too. Uh, they need other things. But out of recognizing the qualities of those who have no more need uh, and their example, then we are inspired to help and to give to those who do have needs. Then in that way, Wisdom and compassion comes together. Then the two accumulation of merit and wisdom can also come together. 141, out of compassion for sentient beings, so these goddesses are singing his praise. Out of compassion for sentient beings, he has throughout 10 million eons trained in generosity, self-control and restraint, and thus attained awakening. His discipline is pure, his conduct is excellent, and his practice undiminished. He will not pursue pleasures and enjoyments, but observe discipline. Here again, right? It's not that, you know, we should be anti-pleasure and enjoyments. It's that in the face of pleasures and enjoyments, we lose our balance. Uh, so having discipline here uh, is not saying that you have to, you know, uh, practice extreme asceticism, right? but rather to understand the power and the blessings of restraint. You know, it's a good thing. See, the other, th there's another situation, which is not what we're advocating, you know, which is kind of uh, always fearful uh, and therefore not trying anything being very careful out of fear. Being very careful out of fear. Uh, if we live our lives like that, forget about Dharma practice, but just in general, if we live our lives like that, you know, we will have a lot of regrets. Uh, kind of we'll look back and say, oh, 20 years ago, I should have been more reckless. <laughs> uh, I was so careful, oh God. Then 20 years later, you still look back and say, oh, 20 years ago when I was thinking, when I was 20, even that time I should have been more, live with more abandonment and do crazy things, you know. So restraint and discipline out of fear is not in the long picture very helpful because you might regret all of that and say, I should not have, you know, been like that. Here, 
this discipline and restraint is based on understanding. And so I, I, I maybe in my own style, I want to say, you know, I, I tend to emphasize more. Understanding has to arise you know, that then leads to us you know, not chasing pleasures and enjoyments because we understand the nature of what that is all about. Not because somebody told us, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. No, not out of guilt. I mean, in this area, yeah? like, because some of us, I know, you know, we are so caught up in, uh, I think, kind of misunderstanding what the teachings are saying when it says, you know, pleasures, you know, from pleasures that you are fine talking about and open to pleasures that you don't want to talk about, okay? <laughs> Without going into details, the whole range of pleasures, whatever give you pleasure, you know, we think, oh, a spiritual person should not like these things, you know? That's kind of a wrong way to go about it, you know? That's, that's kind of based on fear. Until and unless, and of course we have to make the effort. You cannot say until and unless that happens and wait for it to automatically happen. It's not going to automatically happen. You're not going to automatically see uh, the, the nature of you know, what we call pleasure and enjoyments. You make effort to see the nature of such experiences. Then the more you see uh, all the pros and cons, uh, then you are in a better position to kind of begin to change the way you act, the way you orientate your life right, into a more healthy approach right, to anything. Then discipline and restraint right, comes up right, in, in a healthy way, I feel. Then you say, it is good right, to practice restraint, especially now in our culture, in many cultures, I think it's just a phenomenon of like uh, human beings uh, feeling more and more uh, in control. Although uh, <laughs> in the last few months, you know, maybe all of that is also fraying. But until the last few months, we feel like, you know, we are in control. We are becoming invincible. Uh, then a little bit more brave, you know. And then like, you know, uh, a lot of like, just do whatever you want. That too, you know, uh, can lead to so much suffering. So it's good to remember, you know, there's so much power uh, that you can develop by developing the power of restraint. Not saying something out of fear, and not saying something out of exercising the power of restraint are two different things. The first one makes you feel weaker and weaker and more and more taken advantage of, more and more a victim. The second one puts you in a position of confidence. I'm not saying this, not out of fear, but out of understanding this, this is not actually going to help. It's just the wounded part of me wants to say this, wants to do this. But the wounded part of me should not be the one calling the shots here. I, I can give space for the woundedness of me. That one you have to take care of too. But you don't need to let that voice make decisions of what you do or you don't do. Yeah, so we need to have those, recognize that. So please, you know, observe the disciplines, observe restraint uh, based on understanding, uh, not based on fear, uh, not based on just, you know, curbing, 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 pressing down, pressing down, pressing down. It will all boil up and explode. 
He always spoke patiently to protect others. Speaking patiently to protect others. That is something worth paying attention to. Sometimes when we see other people doing, you know, foolish things, destructive things, we lose, we lose patience. I'm the first, you know, to admit, you know, I lose patience. Then we fail to protect others. We, we, we lose the ability to protect others. So here, he spoke patiently to protect others. Even when his limbs were cut off, he was never angry or hostile. Very hard to do. Again, don't use this line to judge other people. Especially right now, you know, in the situation uh, in the United States, many people are in pain, emotional mostly, good number physical, anguish. Should we all be like the 10th ground bodhisattvas, even when limbs were cut off, there is no anger or hostility? Yes. Are we anywhere close? Probably not. Should we expect other people to also be close when we are not? I don't think so. To commit ourselves to non-hostility and not having anger is always part of our practice. But to judge others when others engage in that is not to recognize that where they are coming from is a place of pain. Dukkha is the problem. Grasping or thirsting is the cause of that problem. Constantly diligent for millions of eons, he never felt disheartened. We, you know, feel disheartened for sure. So we say, I take refuge in Buddha, meaning I take him. I take Buddha as my reference point. So if we're serious about those words of refuge, which we repeat every day, several times a day for some of us, then we have to at least do some degree of developing in the same way that he wasn't easily disheartened. Thus he was awakened and performed millions of sacrifices. So here his sacrifices is related to his not being disheartened. So again, a very interesting connection, right? We stop sacrificing when we have become disheartened. We might think, you know, like, oh, the person sacrificed, we think of it as gave up because they have become disheartened. So they have given up. Now, actually here, the Bodhisattva is able to perform millions of sacrifices, giving up in a way, superficially it looks like, but that's because the Bodhisattva was never disheartened or has developed the power of not being disheartened, not being disappointed that what they were hoping to accomplish the good that they were training to see in others, no matter how that seems to prove the opposite, the Bodhisattva 
was not disheartened. Always in meditative concentration, his mind has become calm and tranquil. Since he has burned away all emotions, he will liberate millions of beings. All emotions, all afflictive emotions. He possesses unobstructed knowledge and is free from conceptual thinking. With a mind free from conceptuality, he will become a self-arising victor. His mind is always suffused with love and his compassion is complete. He possesses joy, equanimity, concentration, and knows the four immeasurables. Right? Love, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. Somebody um, sent an email asking Urban Dharma, Hey, has, uh, has Dr. Lai given any programs, extended teachings on the four immeasurables? And so they asked me, I'm like, huh, actually, no. <laughs> so maybe you know, at some point, uh, maybe four part on the four immeasurables. Yeah? They're, they're so important, you know, but we've not really done anything on the four immeasurables. He is the supreme God of gods, worthy of all God's worship. With his pure, stainless, and sublime mind, he perfected millions of qualities. He is a refuge for the frightened, a lamp for the blind. He is a place of rest for the persecuted, a physician for those long sick. He is like a king, a righteous king, like Chakra with a thousand eyes. Chakra is the Indian uh, king of gods. Like the self-arisen Brahma, pure in body and mind. Brahma is, in the Indian uh, context, considered the one, the originator of the universe, the creator. Of course, Buddhists don't think of creator in that sense. Uh, it's often said that Buddhists, you know, as Buddhists, we don't believe in the, the, the such a creator being, right? But if you want to be more technical, I, I want to also point out, but it doesn't mean that Buddhists don't believe, you know, that there are powers that like put together things. When we say that we don't believe that there's a creator God, we're saying there's no single originator that you can trace everything back to that one entity, one being. But doesn't mean, you know, there are no carpenters and architects that are involved <laughs> in building this or that thing. We don't deny that. <laughs> what we're denying is, you know, an ultimate cause that you trace all the way, way back to and said that, you know, he, she, or it planned all of this right? and have decided all how all of this is going to turn out. That, that kind of thinking um, is not part of the Buddhist system. He is firm with abundant knowledge, diligent and detached. Detached here, again, uh, is not out of denial, not out of fear, uh, but he is unentangled. In uh, normal use of the word attachment and detachment in psychology, uh, like modern psychology, uh, there is healthy attachments as well as unhealthy detachments. And so don't mix, you know, uh, what psychology is saying and, and what is being said here. Here is, talk, is talking about he is unentangled. He doesn't get entangled anymore. Yeah. He is a hero because he destroyed the afflictions. Uh, Shantideva reminds us, you know, the true enemy are the afflictions. Undefeated, he conquers all enemies. All the enemies that exist, exist because of our karma and our perception. The true enemy are the 
afflictions, the vexations, the afflictive emotions. So Shantideva reminds us, you know, the worst murderous person you can encounter, at worst, you know, they can take you and end your life, this life. But your afflictive emotions uh, can throw you down into the hell realms, lifetime after lifetime. Uh, in the hungry ghost realm, lifetime after lifetime. But in the face of the external enemy, uh, we allow the inner enemies to fester, to grow and to multiply. So in fact, then the external enemy is a mere condition and you have, you have, you have, like uh, produced all the inner causes for suffering. Just simply, you know how, in on a much smaller scale, but you can see how this works. You wake up one morning, some morning, which we all have this experience, because we didn't sleep so well last night. We didn't sleep so well last night night because of whatever reason you know earlier in the night all of that so you wake up you know a little groggy you come down and because you're groggy while making your coffee you spill something and maybe the coffee beans fell all over the place and then from that on right you get annoyed and I can guarantee you the rest of the morning is gone. Just from a little thing like that. But we might even say I'm running late and this and that. And, you know, it quickly just kind of snowballs. And this is the nature of uh, these afflictive emotions. They grow. And, and we might think, you know, it's, it, it's the outside, but the outside is merely uh, kind of a catalyst. And inside we start feeding and feeding and feeding. He is fearless like a lion and gentle like an elephant. He is the leader of the herd like a perfect bull, always patient and without anger. He is bright like the moon and illuminating like the sun. He shines like a torch and glows like a star. He is unstained like a lotus and his discipline smells sweet like a flower. This teacher is immovable like Mount Meru and provides sustenance like the earth. He is unshakable like an ocean. He has defeated the demon of the afflictions and the demon of the aggregates. He has defeated the demon of death and the demon of the God. These are the four Maras. The four Maras, the demon of the afflictive emotions, the demon of the aggregates, which is the aggregates are the constant that which constitutes our body and mind. He has defeated the demon of death. And then demon of the God is talking about pride. Confidence built on hubris is the demon of the gods. These are the four Mars. He is the great leader who soon will teach the supreme eightfold path of the noble ones to those who are established in wrong paths. Free from the darkness of ignorance, he destroys all age, death, and the afflictions. He will become the self-arisen victor, famous on earth and in heaven, and in the form of the supreme being, he is praised in infinite ways. Through the merit of praising you, may we become like you, the lion of speech. May we become like you. It's an important, important prayer to do whenever we pray, quote-unquote, to Buddhas. Because our prayers to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the end cannot be done in that theistic style where we are thinking there's an all-powerful problem solver 
uh, or powerful problem solvers over there. And over here, uh, we are at the mercy of until uh, problem solvers come. No. Uh, because, not because they are not kind, not because they're not compassionate, not because Avalokiteshwara is not compassionate, not because Jesus is not compassionate, but because where the problem originated, it is also where that problem has to end. So the problem can end when we know how to emulate the Buddha. So all these praises of how great the Buddha is, how great, how great, how great, how great, you know, at the end, somewhere in there, whether explicitly or implicitly, uh, it has to say, may I become like you. <clears throat> may I become like you. That is the most important. And this is what distinguishes when sometimes people say, oh, wait, I thought Buddhists don't pray. Buddhists can pray uh, as long as they don't forget this line. A prayer as in, you know, sing hymns and praise, you know. Oh, Buddha, you're so great. Oh, Bodhisattvas, you're so great. You're so great. You're so great. You're so great. At the end, yeah, it has to be, may I become like you. <clears throat> so may we all uh, become like the Buddha. Any questions, comments? Let's see. Dr. Lai? Yes. Uh, more questions. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, explain the concept of self-arisen? Uh, self-arisen in this context means uh, he realized Buddhahood huh? by himself, just as all of us have to realize Buddhahood by ourselves. Doesn't mean, you know, that, there are no teachers and all that. But in the end, who realizes it? Your father cannot realize it for you. Your mother cannot realize it for you. Your teacher cannot realize it for you. You have to realize it yourself. Self-realize. <clears throat> And what is the difference between the uh, when it's used the self arise arisen on the Buddha and the self arisen on the chakra? <coughs> chakra. Huh? Yeah, yeah, he's using self like uh fifteen one four five like the uh -huh. self arisen Brahma. So it's also self because realized. there is talking about. The Indian's concept of Brahma, there is talking about Brahma as God. So it's, it's using that kind of language, but to turn it around to say the real meaning of self-arisen. Here is you have to you realize it yourself. You cannot look at Brahma. Oh, he is self-arisen. He is self-arisen. He is self-arisen. And all of us arose from him. That's the God system. Brahma is self-arisen. The rest of us are risen from Brahma. Here, playing with that notion of Brahma being self-arisen, we call Buddhas as self-arisen. But we know, ah, here self-arisen actually means to be realized by oneself, to be realized by each in every one of us. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Poetry, not philosophy. <laughs> you also have poetic devices. There is a section at the end, uh, towards the end, uh, starting on 187. You know. mm beautiful you know 
uh, where uh, Buddhist Siddhartha's wife, you know, on 187, just to call your attention, I'm not going to say much about it. I, I think Lalita Vistara to me is such a beautiful text, you know, for, of course, there's a lot of profound Dharma, but it's just simply beautiful. It's also very poetic, you know, and then there's so much to learn in there about like uh, Indian mathematics, uh, about, you know, mm, language, where in the section where Siddhartha was learning, and they say there's like 36 or 72 scripts and different ways of writing Sanskrit uh, and all the names. Mm. But uh, so here on 187, it's just beautiful. Normally when, you know, I think most of us, when we, the, the story of the Buddha that we have heard or we have read or we think we know, I don't know, for me, I cannot speak for you, you know, the characters are all very flat. <laughs> but the Lalita Vistara is just filled with, you know, like you can feel like, ah, oh, this, this is, you know, I mean, there's so much about the Lalita Vistara that is fantastical, but even the fantastical, you know, if you remember this, this poetry, then you don't become a Buddhist fundamentalist. Either arguing like, this really happened like this, or you become a Buddhist reformist and say, oh, these texts, then they're, they're, they're not historical. I'm going to read the real historical Buddha texts. And these are just blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but here, you know, he says, like 187, you know, once the Yashodara here called Gopa, when, when Chanda comes back with uh, Siddhartha's jewelry and, and hair that he has cut and his uh, garments and gave it to the wife, she said, alas, you gave me joy. And she was overcome by sorrow and cried out, alas, you gave me joy. Alas, noble man whose face is like the spotless moon. Alas, my most noble of men. Alas, you with excellent marks so stainless and splendid. Alas, my well-born man with a perfect body, well-formed and tapering, you are unequaled. Alas, my Lord, full of supreme qualities, venerated by humans and gods alike and full of great compassion. You see in this language, right, there is no fear of like, praising the beauty of his body, his physical body, as well as pointing out his virtues. So to those who say, you know, like, oh, Buddhism or Indian religion, you know, uh, they are very uptight about the body and this and that. And it's like, it's like you, you have not actually read the text. And it's a very sensual culture. teach in the U.S., you know. Maybe those of you who don't live in the U.S., maybe a harder time to understand this, but there are many people, in, I feel, in the United States that have a very um, disembodied uh, existence, not in touch with the body. And because of not being in touch with the body, all kinds of uh, unhealthy body relationships hating the body. And then sometimes the hating the body can take the route of becoming spiritual and de denying the body. Sometimes the hating the body can go in the direction of indulgence, trying to figure out how to please the body. All of it comes from this fear and this uh, misconception about senses, you know, and sensual experiences, huh? experiences of the senses. I think if you look at you know, Lalita Vistara, it's, it's very sensual, but it also shows us, you know, nature of sense experiences. Anyway, alas, my powerful man who is strong as Narayana, which is another name for Vishnu, 
You conquer the hordes of demons. Alas, my gentle love with a voice as sweet as Brahma's. Uh, Brahma is the one who recited the Veda, and that's why his voice is sweet. And as soft as the sound of a nightingale. So Yashodara said, Siddhartha's voice is as sweet as Brahma's and as soft as that of a nightingale. Alas, my man of limitless renown, you have emerged from hundreds of virtues and have stainless merits. Alas, you are my love with glory beyond limits, adorned with good qualities. Alas, my handsome love, who was born in the sublime forest of Lumbini. Alas, my sweet tasting man with lips like the bimba fruit. <laughs> oh, she has tasted those lips and she remembers, you know. And so she is in pain. Uh, but she also knows yeah, the inequalities of this man. My dear one with spotless teeth as white as cow's milk or snow. Alas, my dear one with a beautiful nose, beautiful eyebrows, and the stainless circling hair between your brows. Alas, my dear one with shoulders so well formed, with a waist like a bow, legs like a deer, and rounded hips. So this whole section, you know, Chanda, I am miserable, for I have been showed a treasure, uh, 199. Yet now, since it is like my eyes have been gouged, restore my sight, Chanda. The victorious ones always teach that one's parents are to be honored. If he abandoned them, needless to mention that he would leave the pleasures of love with a woman. Alas, to separate from those we love is like watching a play. Nothing endures. So here in this section, you see Yashodara's conflict. You see how, and this to me, you know, you, 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 you can see all of the things that we care so much about in this life, in this world. And yet able to see from a Dharma perspective what this is and to be caught up in this situation where we're not, on the one hand, we want so much to be free. On the other hand, you know, we also cannot let go. This is the human condition. Yeah, this is real. This is very real. Things are not, you know, just black and white. So anyway, enjoy the rest of this chapter. On so many levels, and may we become like him. Chanju sem churim puje Magye pa nam ke gyurji Ke pa nyam pa me pa yam Gone gong du Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Gracias. Thank Gracias. you. Gracias.